Hi, and welcome to Answers News for Thursday, June the 20th, 2019. I'm Avery Foley. I'm here with Dr. Georgia Purdom. And Ken Ham, you're finally back. We haven't had you on here in a little while. I'm back. You I've are? been away for millions of years. <laughs> it feels like it. And now I'm back. <laughs> okay. That's been... why Answers News has been so nice. <laughs> oh, did you hear that? And I always yeah. say nice things about her. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> so... Uh. I am. Uh, we should be getting online. You're, on, um, you're following on your Facebook page, oh, the Ken Ham Facebook it, page. I'm following up. comments on YouTube, and George is following comments on the Answers in Genesis Facebook page. If you want to okay. leave some comments, tell us where you're from, say hi, all that great stuff. So just stuff. as people are getting online, we have a great studio audience. We do. We do. Want to clap and say hi? <laughs> okay. You are now all famous. Nobody can see you, but they can hear you. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, just uh, as we get ready here, and as people are starting to get along, we're starting to get some comments now. Someone looking for watching from Cardiff, Wales. Mm, Thought I'd wow. show you, uh, this is the latest video we took, actually, of the Ark Encounter. We, the blue stuff is sky. What? This blue sky still <laughs> we exists? We have seen that in a long time. Uh, what? <laughs> yeah, we've had so much rain lately that even some of the people on the radio stations around here are talking about just as well we have an ark in our backyard. Uh, <laughs> people have heard them talking about that. That's uh, at the back. We're expanding the zoo. And Looks that'll amazing. be open over the next few few months. Would have liked to have been open by now, but rain has really held up yeah. all our construction. <laughs> yeah, area. a lot of rain. Uh, so. And that first uh, building you saw there was our answer center. I was speaking down there the other day, and you can see the people in the answer center. Mm -hmm. And we just opened our brand new playground. At it is amazing. My two and a half year old loves that playground. So, All he wants to do now is go to the ark. All he wants uh, to do. And we have a similar sort of playground here at the Creation mm -hmm. Museum as well. Mm -hmm. And they enable families. In other words, parents, grandparents, to go on them. You should try the slide, the one down the <laughs> ark. My husband said it was really fast. <laughs> yeah, I, some of them went down there and they, they came off and said, probably need to call 911 now. But uh, anyway, so just wanted to show you that. But at the Creation Museum, have a look here. What do you think this is up here? Rainbow. It's a rainbow. Aww, that's pretty. And there we have another rainbow. We have the Two dinosaur. Oh, it's a double at, rainbow. At, at the front of the museum. And then in the Creation Museum, you'll see this exhibit with a rainbow in it. And this is uh, the sacrifice after the flood. And at night, if you're there when it gets dark, you'll see a rainbow on the ark and a cross lit up on the door. And then on the ark on the third deck, we have the rainbow exhibit. And at the playground, we have a rainbow maze. And we're just getting ready to install this sign. And that's what I wanted to talk about because they call June Gray, Gay Pride Month. Mm -hmm. And I noticed someone as they're walking in actually has one of our t-shirts you can get down at the Ark. It's taking back the rainbow. And I saw that because here's the true meaning of the rainbow. After the global flood, God promised Noah that he would never flood the whole earth again. And from that point on, the rainbow, rainbows have been a visible symbol of this promise. This is the true meaning of the rainbow. And uh, so we should have, we should make it... Um, the Bible's Rainbow Pride Month. Rainbow Pride Month. Yeah, we're yeah. proud of what God did. Yeah, proud of his promise. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, and his proud mercy of and grace in yeah. saving us. Uh, yeah. Exactly. Then I Absolutely. wanted to mention this to you. PureFlix, which is the family-friendly, faith-friendly alternative to Netflix. Uh, actually, we have done a special deal uh, with... PureFlix and your subscription, they have a subscription for the streaming service, they have all sorts of movies and programs on there. Well now they have 500 of our AIG, Answers in Genesis videos on there. So mm -hmm. if, if nothing else, you can subscribe to PureFlix and get all our Answers in Genesis videos and very soon in the near future when we do streaming, like yeah, Streaming like Answers that. News or streaming live presentations down at the Ark, that'll go on PureFlix as well. And we just did a deal with them. So for a yearly subscription uh, for the 12 months, you will also get not only all the Answers and Genesis videos that are on there, but you'll also get our Answers magazine print and digital format and some free downloads and other things. It's, it's an, an awesome incredible, mm -hmm. incredible mm -hmm. offer. And for instance, right now, if you go on Pure Flix, you can get the An Answering Atheist program. Could you explain mm -hmm. that? Uh, so that's part of their Avery? show called Pure Talk, where, um, and that's hosted by Billy Hollowell, um, who basically sits down with different people. Georgia, your episode's Next coming week. up yeah, soon. Next week. Mm -hmm. um, and just talk about different things 
things, um, apologetics, how to defend your faith when you're talking to atheists and those who have a secular worldview, how can you effectively share the gospel and answer the common questions people have? So they've got a whole host of different people. I think I've seen an episode with Dr. Tommy Mitchell, Dr. Jason Lyle, you, a I couple, think, bunch yeah. of different people on that show. So it's a really great show to tune into. By I think way, you can watch uh, it on Facebook too. A yearly subscription is really less than <clears throat> purchasing one DVD a month. Mm -hmm. And if you go to answersmagazine.com slash pureflix, that particular link, that's where you get this special deal where if you pay a, a year subscription, you mm -hmm. actually get Answers Magazine, the digital magazine, and some other special offers from Answers and Genesis. So that's a really good deal that we've negotiated there. So anyway. I got you, somebody on here that says, first time watching live. I always watch, but usually a few days <laughs> later. Great show. John from Michigan. So Awesome. Great. We have someone from Tasmania, Australia on here, so that's a little closer to where you came from. So, so I have someone Finland. here from Australia. There you are. Wow. Look at that. From all Park over the world. Ridge, Park Ridge, Queensland, Australia. That's not far from where we actually lived. All right. So our first uh, sort of fluff item here, official fluff item here, <laughs> uh, is a California infant to visit all 50 states before five months. So when this couple found out they were having a baby, they decided to do something which, in my opinion, as a mother of two young children is crazy. They decided to get an RV and drive across the United States and visit, eventually they decided to visit all the different states with their RV and their dog and their newborn baby. So the baby's almost five months old and their, their plan is to have hit, I think they have Alaska left is the last one, hit, have hit all 50 states, um, which will put their daughter as part of a very small group of people who have done this. She's one of the youngest to ever have visited all 50 okay, states. Okay, Dr. Purdom, mm -hmm. you're an American. <laughs> True. You were born in America. Yes. How many states have you visited? Well, I haven't visited Alaska and Hawaii. I don't know how many states, definitely over 30. Probably, yeah. Okay. I'm an Australian. I was yeah. born in Australia. <laughs> oh, here we go. Let me guess. <laughs> Have a guess how many states I've visited. You 50. probably visited all 50. All 50. Now, <laughs> have a guess how many states I've actually spoken in. 50? 50. <laughs> All 50. Some wow, states that's a I've lot. just been in the airport. Because <laughs> I'm flying too on other I've, I've spoken in all 50 states. Well, good wow. for you. Well, the thing is, I thought with this five-month-old, she's a problem with this trip, in my opinion, besides the obvious <laughs> of having a newborn on an RV oh, and going across country. I can't imagine. It, it, she, kid's not going to remember anything. No, she's going to remember I anything. I think it's so sad. Like, you went to Hawaii with a five-month-old. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, anyway, it wouldn't be my choice, that's for sure. So, uh, But... But they did say, one of the things I thought was sad was they said they hope they can be inspiring to other families and people who are looking for more of a sense of purpose in life. And I'm thinking, well, you're not going to find that through RVing, okay? Mm -hmm. um, th that's not going to give you a sense of purpose. I mean, granted, they're having more family time. They're obviously not working. Um, doesn't appear to be. And so, yeah, I'm not saying family time isn't important. But it, again, it seems like people on the search, you know, for right, purpose yeah, and yeah. meaning in that's life. That's only and found in Christ. You're going to find that in Christ. You're going to mm -hmm. find that in the gospel, not in an RV. So um, I hope that they do that eventually. You know, you know, when I visited all 50 states, I didn't get a sense of purpose. I got jet lag. <laughs> That's what I mean. <laughs> a road rage or, you know, who knows what else. So, uh, uh. All right. So into our real news, uh, this article, how to support your LGBTQ friends and family. So this comes from Canada, from the CBC, but not just from the CBC. This comes from the CBC's kids website. So this article is this specifically is targeted towards children. That's who is going, are going to be using this website or kids. And it's all about how during Pride Month, you can be loud and proud, um, helping people embrace their gender identity and their sexual orientation, this helping from, people feel loved Canada. and accepted. Yeah, this is from Canada. And you're from Canada. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Which has nothing to do with that. But anyway. I do not support this, just to make but, that clear. <laughs> but they try to help kids know how they can become an ally. And mm -hmm. they call an ally as someone who is friendly towards LGBT and helps them. And so as we were reading through the list and talking about it, the very first one, we said, well, we definitely agree with it. Treat others as you would like to be treated. Well, that's biblical, right? Where did <laughs> you get that from? Exactly right yeah, right because, from the Bible. Because if you're not starting with the Bible, you want, well, you can treat others however you want to treat them. Right, yeah. Right? Um, instead of having a biblical uh, worldview. The next one says, be open-minded. Well, there's no such thing as open-minded, ultimately, because mm -hmm. there's no neutrality. Being different doesn't mean wrong. Well, it depends what you mean depends by different. If, different. if it's different, right. if, if it's... Uh, you know, being um, 
a, a well, different, different behavior wants, according to the Bible. Right. You know, judge what if someone right, yeah. wanted to be yeah. a murderer? Is that okay? Is that a good difference? You're different. I mean, you gotta yeah, exactly. Find that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Be a good listener. Not supposed well, to assume your friends will be straight or heterosexual. Yeah, don't, ass- don't try not to assume that your friends are straight or heterosexual. Then they put in brackets. They they define what heterosexual means because these days you have to define what that means. <laughs> mm-hmm. You know, in other words, everyone knows what homosexual means. Mm-hmm. It's heterosexual. Mm-hmm. It's, it's just it's so ridiculous to go on here. And and they want you know they say well don't um, stand up to those who make homophobic jokes and you know don't let people bully LGBT. Well. We would agree. I mean, you shouldn't be rude or disrespectful mm-hmm. or bullying somebody. But then the question becomes, what does bullying Who's mean? Who's defining and, what that is? Right. Yeah, and absolutely. a lot of times they define that simply as disagreeing mm-hmm. and telling someone, but, you know, speaking the truth in love, they would mm-hmm. call that Sharing bullying. the gospel. Well, yeah. If, you, if yeah. you say these days, well, I believe there's only two genders, male and female, mm-hmm. and marriage is a man mm-hmm. and a woman, they'll call that bullying. Yeah. And they'll call that being mean and mm-hmm. hate speech. Yeah. And homophobic. Because mm-hmm. we've yeah. heard that before. But it's what, not. what got me was the last item on the list. Go to events in your area like pride parades. Like telling kids to go to pride parades, which often have very lewd oh. content and are definitely not child friendly, no. but they're encouraging children to go to those kinds of things. Yeah. And, it's and they like, say, wear, wear a pink triangle uh, or carry a rainbow flag. Well, that's one mm-hmm. of the reasons why I wanted to start off with saying that at the Ark and the Creation Museum, we give the true meaning to the rainbow that God gave. And actually, the rainbow for the gay pride people is six colors. Right. And it actually started because uh, gay people used to use a bright color to identify themselves. Mm-hmm. And then somebody came up with the idea of this rainbow. And of course, uh, the rainbow we use is right. red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet, right. which seven has seven colors. colors. Mm-hmm. And of course, mm-hmm. actually, there's a lot more colors than that yeah. when, when you actually understand light. But there's seven basic colors. And it's God who has given us the meaning of the rainbow after the flood, as we talked about uh, earlier. Well, mm-hmm. they even say, remember that love is love. When two, and when two grown-ups love each other, it's never a bad thing. Okay, here's the thing. Why? That's a completely arbitrary statement. Why are you saying it has to be two grown-ups? Because one of the things we're continually seeing to increase is the idea of pedophilia, mm-hmm. that it's okay for children and adults to have these types mm-hmm. of relationships. This idea that children are sexual beings We just had an article about, was so. it Snapchat? Yep, um, Snapchat it, had a love that. has no age filter. They had it, they, it was only out for two days and then they pulled it. Um, but yeah, right, that idea that... Yeah, love has no age. And mm-hmm. then they, there was some flack from that. Yeah, thankfully, they realized, so they pulled it, but uh, sure. they better pull it. They're but, testing but the waters to see what's are. acceptable right. in the culture. Because they're pushing Can we go this, this more far? and more and more. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah so. and oh, I was thinking when I was reading this and it was saying if two grown-ups love each other, it's never a bad thing. Okay, well, what if this child's parents are married and the father decides he loves his secretary and not their mom? Is that not a bad thing that he's committing adultery with their mom? According to this article, no, the child can't think that's a bad thing even if it breaks their whole family apart because if two adults love each other, and why two? Why can't it be three adults or four adults? Like it's completely arbitrary. As soon as you get away from God's word as a standard, then... You talk faster than I do. (laughs) She does. You can't do that. I get worked yeah. up. I'm you sorry. Can't do that. Hey, I've got a really good idea for people. Instead of going to this CBC Kids website, yes. go to answersandgenesis.org. We have a kids website. We do. Yeah. Kidsanswers.com, I believe, is the URL. Things. And also subscribe to PureFix right. and get them some wholesome programming. Mm-hmm. And you get uh, our programs for kids with Buddy Davis and uh, the Wild, the Wild Brothers, Brothers and, uh, yeah. that you'll Wild see Brothers on there. Wild Brothers is great. Uh, Buddy Davis well. is great. Yeah. All right. This next one from New Scientist I thought was really neat. Brainless fungi trade resources with plants like a stock market. So this is talking about how plants and these fungi kind of have a a symbiotic relationship where the plants provide carbon and the fungi provide phosphorus. Mm -hmm. And they're finding that when these are in an area of, um, for example, part of the the fungi is in an area of high phosphorus and another part of it's in an area of low phosphorus, they'll actually move from that area of high concentration they'll move it over to the area of low concentration and then sell it to the plant. And they presume for more carbon. So and they're, what they're wheeling and dealing. They don't even have a brain and no. they can do this. They, right. they call and, and, <laughs> these, and these and networks can be huge. Right, I mean, yeah. They're underground yeah. networks. And they call huge. it sophisticated. Mm-hmm. Simple brainless organisms capable of sophisticated trading strategies. And yep. the, they go on and say it's, it's a, incredible the way this evolved. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And yeah. Yeah. Maybe this sophisticated, this sophisticated, <laughs> sophisticated uh, design mm-hmm. that they have 
they're evolved able to by do chance all this random processes. And they're always amazed by it. You know why they're amazed? Because how could it happen? Well, it couldn't. It had to be designed. Yeah, mm. these are, these are um, mycorrhizal fungi, which are typically in combination. Most plants have some sort of fungi in association with them, and the mycorrhizae are the, are the most common ones. Yeah, I wasn't going to try but, and pronounce that. Yeah. <laughs> but these are across, literally, I mean, they can be, you know, like miles, like long networks underneath that they have this whole system. And so to think that it's so much more complex than what they ever imagined, um, mm. how these things are doing, and they're still trying to test to see if this model is correct. It's not you know, definitive yet, yeah, but they, but they think, but how could it know without a brain that, oh, I need to move this here because this is low here so I can get more here. And, and we don't know. They've got to figure out what the mechanism is, but it just shows how complex it is. Mm -hmm. yeah, uh, uh, Points the, to the God's design The information of God created is already there. I saw yeah. an ad on TV the other day for a spray for fungi for your toenails. Is that the okay. same fungi? No. <laughs> no, we are not even going to go there. Okay? No, we're not going there. That's just no. <laughs> yeah. Okay, moving on from oh, that I've just intriguing it's, it's comment. I don't want to hear about that. Okay, Gross. so let's just move on. No, we don't. We don't have ads on this for a reason. So. Oh gosh. <laughs> this one comes from Yale News. Discoveries indicate human ancestors repeatedly invented stone tools. So in Ethiopia, they've discovered what they believe to be the earliest known examples of complex stone tools, meaning that they now have to believe that human, different populations of early humans all figured out how to make stone tools independently from one another. Um, and this just cracked me up when we were reading this, and they're talking about how it turns out it's a lot more complicated to make a stone tool than they thought. <laughs> well, and the thing is, too, like they say, well... We thought that the first stone tools were very simple, very similar to how chimpanzees crack nuts, right? Because they think we evolved from some sort of common ancestor with the chimpanzees. Mm -hmm. So therefore, our first tools would have been very simple, just like the chimpanzees. But it turns out, they said, and it takes quite a bit of know-how, as well as motor control, to hold st two stones together and fracture one to create a sharp edge in a predictable way. It's more complex. See, they can't imagine how early humans would have been doing this. And you know what's interesting? They always say, oh, but chimps use tools, right? Well, you only have to go to the internet and have a look and you'll find out that crows use tools. In fact, crows are probably more intelligent very, using tools yeah. than chimps. Very intelligent, right? yeah. And then elephants use tools and dolphins and sea otters and octopus. I mean, they, there's a lot of it. Even mm -hmm. some way it said wasps use tools. I mean, but, yeah. you know, and the, the other interesting thing is this. Have you ever seen an animal use a tool to make a tool? Only humans use a tool to make a tool. And they're also saying with these uh, particular, you know, sharp uh, tools that uh, humans made, that that took a lot of ingenuity because it's, mm -hmm. it's not just a matter of like a chimp does, pick up a rock and use it to smash something. Right. It's actually right, yeah. making a tool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and we're not surprised at this from a biblical no. perspective. Of course, we don't believe they're millions of years old, but the Bible makes it clear that man was intelligent from the very beginning, that he was working with bronze and metal, that he was making Genesis musical instruments. Four. I mean, mm -hmm. that's all in Genesis 4. And so it, it, this isn't surprising from a well, creation perspective. No, but it, They're also saying it looks like tool making technology evolved in different places mm -hmm. because multiple we times. You, multiple times and so they don't it, have to explain it once now thing. they have to explain it multiple times get rid of an evolutionary worldview right in an evolutionary worldview you know man learns to grunt and then he learns to make stone tools and and then he invents a telephone and you know here we are uh, but from a <laughs> biblical perspective biblical perspective you've got man is highly intelligent right from the start mm -hmm. as georgia said uh, workers of bronze and iron mm -hmm. within the set first seven generations and that's why when you go to our ark exhibit, some people say, how come you use iron on the ark? Noah wouldn't have used iron. Actually, we had to because of code. But <laughs> the second thing is, the second thing is, who said Noah wouldn't have had iron? They were using iron right. way before Noah, yeah. right? right? Yeah. So they probably did use iron. But then the other thing is, after the flood, uh, as people built up on the earth and then the Tower of Babel, as people moved away from the Tower of Babel, 
Some might go and live in caves and make stone tools and some might go and, and build mm -hmm. our structures using wood and as people move away from each other, instead of you know, Stone Age to Bronze Age to Iron Age evolutionary progression, they could have had all these different sorts of technology all at the same time and mm -hmm. spread in different places because man's intelligent and no doubt Noah brought technology off the ark with him and they already had a lot of technology at the time of the Tower of Babel. So it's a whole different way of viewing mm -hmm. things and you'll see that with the exhibits at the Ark and the Creation Museum. Absolutely. Someone in the comments here said they're watching from Barbados in the Caribbean, and they said, thanks for the info. I'll use it to teach my teen Sunday school class. Sounds That's pretty awesome. cool. I'd like to hear yeah. that. That's I've great. I've got a lot of different states. I've got California, Arkansas, um, UK, well, UK, that's not a state, but North Carolina, <laughs> Ohio, Alabama, Florida, all over the place. Somebody said here, Avery talks fast. Hey, <laughs> I'm Canadian. I can't help it. <laughs> Is that a Canadian genetic thing or something? I don't know. Canadians talk fast. Yeah, it's just a thing. You're a Christian Canadian, which means you probably can't even get back into the country now. <laughs> Shh. I have to go home and visit my family at some point. <laughs> Hopefully. <laughs> All right. This. This is one of those ones where we read these headlines and we think we've heard everything and then we realize we have not heard everything yet. Elementary kids get su special surprise drag performance at school talent show. This is in New York, right? Yes, East Harlem at an, an elementary school. So these are young kids we're talking about. The parents take their children to a talent show like parents have been doing for a very long time. They're watching this talent show and at the very end of the little handout they got, it says special surprise. And the special surprise turns out to be the president of the PTA doing a drag show yeah. on the stage for all the little nine and ten year olds in the audience. Like, and so one woman was <sighs> there videoing, and she was videoing her child, and then this drag uh, queen came out and danced with the child, right? Yeah, I'm not exactly not, sure that. The, you I think know, it was uh, he was up there by himself. Yeah, I think he was up there by himself, but. But this is, again, it's this whole idea of trying to push pedophilia, mm -hmm. trying to push LGBT. I mean, this is an The sexualization dance. of children. Yeah. It's yeah. so and, wrong. But I was glad she spoke out. That's what I, mm -hmm. really, uh, I really appreciate and admire is parents have to keep speaking out. We have to say yes. that this is wrong and this should not be going on, period. We, we talked about a, a show, or not a show, but a program at a library last week in Delaware, Ohio. And um, since that we had talked about that, um, they've, they've actually, not because necessarily we talked about it, but a lot of people complained about it. A lot of people have been it. complaining, yeah. And the, the, um, the class on drag was pulled from the library. They're not longer doing it anymore. Good. Which is great. Right? Yes. That's what we need to do. Well, so listen parents, to this really strong statement from up. the Department of Education. <laughs> the content of the performance was inappropriate. There's an understatement <laughs> here. Understatement, a little. Hey, what would have happened if they said, surprise guest, and it was Ken Ham? <laughs> <laughs> They'd all leave for sure. You probably yeah. would have made more of a splash than and this I guy did. And I started telling them about creation and God. Mm -hmm. We'd probably hear more about that oh, absolutely. than we hear about this was, oh, I mean, this was barely in the news. This wasn't like the all over the mainstream media. The Freedom for Religion Foundation would be suing the school. Yeah. Absolutely. Oh, definitely. In yeah. a heartbeat. Yeah. It just goes to show you. So, mm -hmm. yeah. But we have to keep speaking up. That's one thing I, I want to encourage yes, everyone to absolutely. do. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So somebody here said, Tubal Cain, the first person to work with bronze and iron, Genesis 422. And that is correct. They were mm -hmm. workers of bronze and iron. And they made musical instruments, too, back then. They did indeed. All right. This next one comes from Science Daily. How multi-celled animals developed. Now, we frequently say on this show that it seems like every single episode, everything we know about evolution has changed. We already saw that with the stone tools. Everything we know about stone tool evolution has changed. Well, now we have to rewrite the textbooks again because now everything you thought you knew about how multicellular organisms developed, it's all wrong. Yeah. So, so what they did, so the story goes like this. There, so the idea is how do we get from a unicellular organism to a multicellular organism? Unicellular and means one. Yeah. Right. Okay, I think they know You're a that. scientist. Like I, was just, I, was, I was translating. Good, so good anyway, job, Jacqueline. So, so what they believe happened is they believe that um, an organism called um, uh, uh, conophylagellate, um, so it's kind of a big word, but conophylagellate, <laughs> they're unicellular, they live on their own, and they say at some point in the past, right, billions of year, millions of years ago, they decided to congregate and get together, okay, and started to specialize within it, and that became a sponge. So a sponge is like one of the early, is the earliest multicellular organism, 
okay? In this view, yeah. Right, so what they, what they decided to do was, okay, so let's look at the expression from the DNA in sponges as compared to these unicellular coanoflagellates that we have today. Because if this, the unicellular, evolved into the multicellular, they should have similar, what we call, expression from their DNA. Guess what they found? They're completely different. And they're like, oh, maybe this isn't how it happened in the past. Yeah, thank so, so now they're <laughs> saying, told you that, but. Now they're saying they think that the original cell that evolved was more like a stem cell. Now a stem cell, you know, in your cells, you actually have all the information that builds you, right. and if you know how to switch them on, that's why they like to take stem cells and they say, if we could only switch on the right ones, we could grow a kidney or a heart or mm -hmm. whatever. Well, now they think, think about what they're saying. Now they think that this original cell had all the information already there. But where does that information come from? That's a pretty big problem. How do you explain well, that? Well, and that means that the original cell was actually more complex and, <laughs> and you had tons of genetic diversity or whatever originally versus what you have now, which is even harder to form by random chance processes, right? And so you're asking for more complexity, basically, initially, and, and yeah. that's a problem. And one of the things that we know is that matter can't produce information by itself. Right. That's so exactly information right. comes from information mm -hmm. and the information has to be read by a code, mm -hmm. and the cell already has the information to make the code to read the information. It's all got to be there. And here they are trying to explain how could life arise by natural processes, and it can't. <laughs> That's mm -hmm. the whole point, you mm -hmm. can't. Yeah. But they say this new study, they say we're taking a core the theory of evolutionary biology and turning it on its head. Again, Again. <laughs> that's the new one for this I, week. I we'll like see what's the, next week. <laughs> I like this statement though. They say, now we have an opportunity to reimagine the steps that gave rise to the first animals. And I think the emphasis should be on imagine. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Because that's all it is. It's just imagination, right? Because they can't, because it's hard to conceive how a unicellular organism could evolve in the first place, much less how you jump from that to mm -hmm. multicellular organisms. And so they, mm -hmm. it's just imagination. It's fairy tales. That's all it is. And Somebody here wants me to go to that school in East Harlem. They say, do it, Ken, do it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think the PTA president will let you. I don't think so. I have a feeling he wouldn't. <laughs> yeah. I, I doubt he's, I hope he's not going to be the PTA president anymore. That's all I got to say. <laughs> Ooh. All right. This next one. Um, My Little Pony cartoon debuts same-sex couple. So most people are probably familiar with My Little Ponies, the colorful little ponies with the um, real hair tail and mane and stuff. Well, there's a cartoon, My Little Pony Friendship is Magic, which is an animated series. And for its final series, it finally brought in, apparently, the parents of this one character, Scootaloo. I've never seen the show, so I don't know anything about any of these characters. But this character, Scootaloo, finally the parents come in. And when the parents come in, it's Aunt Holiday and Aunt Lofty, who are a romantic lesbian couple. They actually say here, with the ninth and final season, uh, fans can look forward to My Little Pony continuing to foster inclusivity in ways that have been a long time coming. It's been a long time coming that they wanted to push the gay agenda mm -hmm. in My Little Pony. And I think one of the saddest things about this whole article, as you read it through, and we have the links to all the article there on our, on our various uh, social media platforms, is that they're talking about all the different kids' cartoons now that are pushing the gay oh, yeah. agenda. Yeah, you know, common. Like, and, and there's Arthur and there's all these others um, Doc as well. McStuffins. Doc McStuffins, yeah. Mm -hmm. And some other ones. And, it, and it's just sad. And, and what I thought was interesting, because I've never watched this cartoon before, okay? <laughs> but um, it said that they, the, the series was praised for having offbeat humor and imagination coupled with complex life lessons, which always kind of concerns me when I hear things like that, because I wonder, well, what's the offbeat humor? Is it crude? You know, whatever. But then right, it says yeah. it's even broken gender barriers, garnering adult male viewers affectionately known as bronies. Okay, yeah, so then like whole I, if an adult male is watching this show, what are they, what are they doing on this show? Right, I mean, I, what's that, that offbeat humor right that's there. attracting that and, demographic? And here's something hmm. to remember, and for all the young people here, remember at any program you're watching on television, because there's a discussion in here about the writers. You know, when you, when you watch, if you watch a TV program like Blue Bloods or, or any of these, there are writers and they have discussions behind the scenes as they mm -hmm. talk about here in the past, it wasn't the right time, they knew it wouldn't be accepted to introduce this, but they were looking for the right time to push the gay mm -hmm. agenda and all that. You know, these writers have an agenda. 
-hmm. And these Hollywood writers, their agenda, by and large, for most of them, is anti-God. Because it's interesting. You watch a program maybe like Blue Buds and you think, oh, it's just about detectives and about police and so on. And, and then suddenly, they'll have a program where Oh, they introduce a gay couple. Yep. And, and they'll and deliberately do this to push that agenda. And they're mm -hmm. doing it in all sorts of programs. Or in a movie, you're watching this movie mm -hmm. that you think is, you know, um, it, it, it's, it's a good movie. It's a cute movie. We watched cute. a movie about a dog one time. And then right? suddenly in the middle of it. And then boom, mm -hmm. it's there. And, and I hope we never get used to that. Like we should never mm -hmm. ever get used to that. Always point it out. Always tell your kids, this is wrong. You know, cause it's gonna be in almost everything they watch. You, it's mm -hmm. hard to stop. It's hard to stop that. And that's another Absolutely. reason why yeah. we encourage yeah. people to get pure flicks. Now I know you're not yeah. gonna agree with every mm -hmm. program and movie on pure flicks. We understand that, but, but, but it's, it's the first major uh, streaming service to be faith friendly, family right. friendly, uh, but, but even if for nothing else, you've got hundreds of AIG videos on there now. Mm -hmm. So you can go it's there and get them. Yeah. And that's uh, what we carry. And there's some other good programming on there. But um, I, I tell you, the, the way in which the world is going right now, when you look at uh, Netflix and uh, the, just the TV programs, it, there's not much that's not pushing all this. Yeah, yeah. True. yeah. True. And we have actually on our website and in the bookstore, we have a little book called The Very Best Plan, which is a little board book mm -hmm. um, for kids. Obviously, it's a board book. It's for young kids that talks about the very best plan being God's design of marriage for one man and one woman. I bought it for my son, and, and it's such a cute little book. The illustrations are adorable. And it really um, is a really fun, positive way of talking to your kids about God's design. Because as we see in this article, you can't assume your two or three-year-old is not right, going to be exposed to this. Mm -hmm. And we don't want that them to become normalized to sin. We want them to right. recognize this is God's plan. So you can even start reading them books like The Very Best Plan, which you can get on our Somebody website. Somebody here said... It's a great little book to start. Nothing is safe any longer. That. Keep our kids mm -hmm. out of your sick agenda. My girl watches Answers News, uh, <laughs> but is not allowed to watch kids programming. I, I, and I understand that. There we are. Well, somebody said it's important to check Christian reviews before watching almost anything. There are, there are, I mean, we talk about some movies and things like that that are mm -hmm. coming out. There's other good Christian websites that do mm -hmm. talk about that and try to at least give you, okay, this is what to expect when you go to see this mm -hmm. movie. And I, that's always a good recommendation. Mm -hmm. Someone here asked the question, what dog movie Dr. Pardon. Your new name is Dr. Pardon. Oh, okay. <laughs> That's interesting. You didn't know that. So, anyways. All right. Well, I, we are out of time for today, but we will be back again on Monday. So, hopefully, you can join us yep. again Monday for the next episode of Answers News.